Hi and welcome to Dr Rod's Bike Surgery. This is the show on men and motors where we invite you, the viewer, to bring your bikes to my workshop where we can work together to help your project get on the road. This week my guest is Ian Granger from Duckingfield in Thameside. Ian's brought along his Vespa scooter, which apparently is having some starting problems and also making suspicious rattling sounds. He's brought it to me to see if I can help him sort out what the problem is. Right, so you've just bought this uh, this wonderful machine then, Ian? Yeah, I bought it from, from an old bloke. Uh, right. I don't think he's really looked after it very well. Right, well it certainly looks smart enough, yeah. but uh, you think there might be something mechanically amiss? Yeah, there was no oil in it when I bought it, so uh, ah, it's a bit rattly. It's not a good sign, is mm. it? That's not a good sign. But it does actually run then? It runs, yeah. So you have been able to ride it? Yeah, and, but yeah. it's had a couple of seizures. Right, yeah, that does sound a little mm. bit, um, possibly, hopefully not too terminal, but something that we might uh, have a look at. Is it possible to run the bike now? Yeah, I can and, start and then, it up, yeah. We can always tell quite a lot by seeing what kind of noise it makes and you know what kind of smoke comes out of the exhaust <laughs> as well. Uh, do you want to have a finer up yep. then? This one's got an electric start it as does, well, hasn't yeah. it? Right. Yeah. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, that's a little bit rattly, isn't it? A little it? bit. Then just give it a little rev. Yeah, now there's quite a lot of smoke coming out of there, which of course there would be anyway with the two strokes. Yeah. So it's difficult to tell whether that's bad news or not. But there's a, a certain buzz to the engine there, which yeah. yeah, perhaps shouldn't be quite as pronounced as it is. So this is a cylinder barrel, that's the cylinder head. And on this layout, the crankshaft is in there, runs mm. that way, the piston goes up and down inside there. Uh, on a motorbike, we'd normally expect to see this yeah. that way up, of course. The clever part about all this design as well is this is actually, or the whole engine comprises a suspension, doesn't it? Yeah. Th this is actually the rear suspension. It is, yeah. So as you're riding the scooter, the whole thing's pivoting up yeah. and down. Brilliant uh, bit of combination <laughs> of design. And of course, these have been around in this layout since the 40s, haven't they? Right? Yeah, middle, middle of the 40s, yeah. Fantastic. Not really altered a lot either. <laughs> right. <laughs> they obviously got it right when they did it. Yeah. Right, so the next thing we need to do, we think we've got a problem with the noise coming from in here. Yep. And this is certainly the bit that suffers if there has been a lubrication problem. So what we're going to have to do is get this top end of the engine off and let's have a look inside it and, yep. and see what we can find. Right, so the first thing we're going to have a crack at then is dropping this exhaust, exhaust system yep. out of the way. And that's a 13mm nut on there. So if I just slacken that off. And we did cheat slightly by slattening the nut off at we the did, other yeah. side, so hopefully... Am I right in thinking that just pulls loose? It should loose? do, yeah, with a bit of luck. Right, oops. Now then, do we need to give that a little tap? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Um, there should be a rubber hammer across there in the toolbox. And if we can just get that on the exhaust system, it should just tap it free. If That's not, so Can you get in there, the, all right? Uh, might have to take the bolt off. Okay. Otherwise. Is that starting to come? Uh, is that loose? Yep, it's off. Right, that's super. Right, so that's now pulled free from yeah. the exhaust port there. If you just move the Kickstarter out of the way, that's it. You can see where that's come off now. Yeah. I've got to say, this is a great design. It's uh, a lot easier, a, isn't it? A, a lot of the Japanese mopeds, you'll find the exhaust system is holding with too little That's uh, very hard to get studs. to, yeah. Yeah, and they rust up. Yeah. And you put a spanner on them and they shear off, yeah. and it can be a nightmare getting them fixed. So this is a lot easier. So I just need a 13mm socket now. Right, and we've got one, hopefully, to hand. And this is to remove the cylinder head. Because the engine's Thank you. laid over like that, it's actually a doddle to get to all this, all this stuff, isn't it? Yeah. And on any motorbike, you'd have to take petrol tanks off and yep. lots of things off to get at this. Most of the jobs that you need to do on the engine, you can do it with the engine in the frame on these. Hmm. Well, of course, that's one of the things that perhaps leaves this design open to criticism. With the engine on this side, then all the weight's at one side, isn't it? Does that affect the handling? Not at all, no. Everyone always says Vespa's uh, weighted on one side, but I've never noticed a problem. Right. Of course, the, the, the traditional rival was the Lambretta, wasn't it? Are, yeah. are they different? Is the engine in a different place? Or? It's pretty similar, really. It's a... You can still get to it from one side. I might just have to lift that uh, okay. clip out. Oops. Oh, I see, yeah. And there we go, and that's the cylinder head coming off. Yeah. Is she going to clear out of there? Brilliant. All the washers are still there as well. Right. 
Right, silly head out of the way. We'll come back and have another look at that in a moment yeah. or two. But we're nearly down to the gubbins, which is this. And this is the bit that we're concerned about. If there has been any kind of a lubrication failure, it can affect what's happened in there and the bearings. So what we should be able to do now, am I right in thinking that'll just slide off? It will, but it's going to touch the frame. So yeah. we're going to have to take these studs out first. Right, that's the easiest way to do it, is it? Yeah. Um, I suppose another alternative would be to unbolt the whole engine assembly. Yeah, but it takes a lot, lot longer. Right, okay. So we're um, going to need a couple of nuts. This is the clever way of getting yeah. studs out. Unless you've got a stud extractor. Um, well, not to hand, but if you've got this method and it's going to work, then I'm very happy to go with it. This is what we've done so far. First of all, we've had to remove the right-hand cowling from the bike in order to find out where the engine is. Underneath there, there's another cowling over the engine, which is for the air cooling system, and we've had to take that off too. Once that's out of the way, we can then see the cylinder barrel and the cylinder head. But before we can dismantle it, the exhaust system has to come off. It's a fairly straightforward matter then to take off the cylinder head, and finally, we now have to remove these four studs in order to pull the barrel free. Well, it's nice to get outside for a break from the workshop on this been lovely a, day. It's been a busy day. <laughs> it certainly has, yeah. Uh, there's quite a scene about these scooters, isn't there, Ian? There is, yeah. Um, it's probably a rally on every weekend, at least. Is somewhere really? in the country. Yeah. Um, we get up to 10,000 people at the biggest rally of the year Do in the Isle really? of Wight, yeah. So it's quite a big underground scene. You don't see them every day. Right. But they are out there. Right. And this is the Isle of Wight, is this when, when August or August bank holiday, yeah. Yeah. Of course, that's, that's the, the big, big weekend in the biking calendar yeah, too, that's yeah. Right. And you're getting so. 10,000 people there. Yep. All, all over scooters. the world. Yep. Anyway, shall we pop back and see how she's yep. running? Okay. Doke. Okay. Right, we should just be able to pull this free now, so this is moment of truth. And, yes, there it goes. And there's the barrel coming off the piston, and there's the piston. And will that quite clear? If I support the piston, can you pull that free? There we go. Right, and now then, what can we see? If you pop the barrel down for a second, we'll have a look at that in a minute. But immediately there, you yep. can see the markings on the piston there. And there is some sign that that's been picking up on the side of the cylinder barrel. So I think you are absolutely right, Ian. That's going to need a little bit of attention. As the cylinder barrel comes free, it's most important that we support the weight of the piston because if it clangs down onto the crankcase mouth, it could damage the piston further. So I'm holding the piston while Ian takes the barrel off. Well, that's good as so far. So come back in part two to see how we get on. Welcome to part two, and this week in Dr. Rod's bike surgery, we have Ian Granger with his Vespa scooter, which has had some difficulty starting. Right, well, this is a barrel we've just taken off, Ian, and we've got another one here which we've rebought because yep. we knew this might be a problem today. But in there, I can see quite a lot of scuff marks on the bore. Now, it may not be obvious to see, but if you just run your finger across there, can you feel it? Oh, that? yeah. Quite a big ridge. That's quite badly yeah. ridged, yeah. And you may be able to tell, actually, just looking at that, you can see the difference between that one which has yeah. just been freshly machined. Now, what happens, of course, if there is a lubrication failure, as the piston's moving up and down in there, instead of having a nice film of oil to lubricate them, yeah. you get a metal-to-metal -metal contact, mm -hmm. and that's what does the damage. Now, the other thing that we do need to have a look at is the piston rings, or we'll certainly have a look at them while we're here. These fit onto the piston, and we can use these to give us an idea of what, how much wear has taken place inside the bore. Now, of course, there are two main reasons why you might want to rebore an engine. One is damage, which is this type of thing. The other one is simply wear, because any yeah. engine will eventually wear itself out if it does lots and lots of miles. So while we know that we're going to have to rebore this one, this is useful just to see how we check it for wear. What I've done is I've popped the piston ring into the cylinder bore like that. And the piston ring, as it goes in, it compresses like that. It springs out, effectively, against the barrel. So what I can do now is measure the end gap on the piston ring. And that'll give me a measure of how much wear there is in there. In fact, do you want to have a go at this? I can do, yeah. If you use a feeler gauge, which is these, just try popping that one into that gap in there. And see if that yeah, clears. That clears. Is that OK? Yeah. Just try a fatter feeler gauge, if you would. These are all different thicknesses, yeah. and the number on tells you how thick the gauge is. And what you're, what you're aiming to do is find a gauge that, that slides through and just drags through the gap. Okay. Just about feel that. Right. 
And of course, if you look in your workshop manual, it will tell you exactly what the ring gap should be on a new engine, and yeah. ideally that's what we're hoping to find. Just as a tip, if you are checking for wear, because of the way the engine works, as the piston moves up and down the cylinder, it rocks sideways, like that. And you'll find that the cylinder bores always wear more at the top than they do at the bottom. Right. So what we would do to measure the wear on that one is, having taken the measurement from the top, we could then turn it over, put the piston ring into the bottom, where, where, there's, where you get no wear at all, because that part of the bore never wears, and then you'd repeat that measurement there. And then if you write all these figures down, which of course we aren't doing today, uh, you can compare that measurement to that measurement and that will give you a reasonable indication of how much wear has yeah. gone on in the cylinder bore. Now, but of course, as we've said, we know that we're going to have to replace that one. This is one that's been rebored, so it's been machined. It's had some metal skimmed out of the inside of there, so that's perfectly round again. If you want to pop the new piston ring in, we'll just have a look at the ring gap on that, and that should be exactly within the manufacturer's tolerances. Uh, and reboring this is quite a skilled operation. So we've that's been actually a way to somewhere that specialises in this. Yeah, there's no gap there at all. Right, right. you should you should have a little bit of a gap, but yeah. it's probably going to be less than this yeah. one. And that should bring it back to factory specification. There is a more precise way of measuring cylinder bore wear with a micrometer, but using a piston ring like this you can get a very good idea of whether the cylinder barrel needs any kind of reconditioning work or not. The gap at the top of the cylinder bore should be about the same as the gap at the bottom. If the two gaps measure differently, the bore certainly needs reboring. If the two gaps are the same but the gap is still beyond the factory service limits, you may get away with simply fitting new piston rings. Right, in order to get the gudgeon pin out now and separate the piston from the conrod, what we've done first of all is warmed up a rag in hot water and then put that on the piston crown. And that expands the aluminium so it makes it a little bit easier to free off. Now, if you just tap the end of that drift, I'm hoping... What? Yep, that, that feels like it's moved just at that side. <laughs> just needed that last bit. And if we're lucky, now... Yep, there she comes. And that's the piston separated from the rod. There we go. And that's the old gudgeon pin is, is still in there. And we can leave that in because we'll be using a new one. Uh, and you can see now how much wear there is on that. If you compare that to the new piston, you can see the difference between those two. So we've seen some damage on the cylinder bore and also on the old piston as well. And that's down to lubrication failure yep. of some kind. So it looks like it was a wise move getting this bike I think so, yeah. Right, all we need to do now is fit the new piston. Uh, but before we do that, of course, the other thing we'll have a look at is a small end bearing which is there. And the piston pivots on that end of the, of the conrod. As the engine runs, that goes up and down like that, and the piston pivots on it. So we've got a bearing inside there, which is that one. And on a two-stroke engine, you always get a needle roller bearing like that. A four-stroke would probably not have a bearing at all. No. The pin just, just pivots in there. But that needle roller bearing, though it may look to be in good condition, it's actually almost impossible to tell just by looking at it whether that's had any wear. And what I'd recommend is, having stripped it this far, let's put a new small end bearing in it. And there's the new one. So what we're going to do to assemble it all first is discard the old small end bearing. We'll put some fresh oil on that before it all goes finally yeah. back together. And then that's going to go into there. But next, we need to do a little bit of preparation on the new piston before mm -hmm. we can fit it. On this kind of engine, I'd always recommend fitting a new small end bearing each time you remove the piston. Small end bearings aren't expensive and they do take a lot of load, and it's quite easy to put one in now rather than have it fail later. Right, before the new piston goes in, I'm carefully fitting the new piston rings, and they just gently ease over into the groove, like that. Now, piston rings are quite brittle, so they do need handling fairly carefully because they're quite easy to snap and they're uh, expensive as well. But what you'll also find on a two-stroke piston, you can see that peg there, and the piston rings have a little groove. So they sit around that pin like that. And the idea of that is to stop the piston rings rotating in the cylinder as the engine runs. Because on a two-stroke, they get broken as you hit the ports at the side there. So they need to be correctly engaged like that. Now the other problem we've just discovered as well is the new gudgeon pin that's been supplied with the piston is actually far too small. So what we're doing is we're reusing the old one. Now, I wouldn't normally do that because you do tend to replace these as a set with yep. a new small end bearing. But in this particular case, there's very minimal wear on there. 
we don't think there was any problem with the old small end anyway, no. so we'll probably get away with it. But the option, of course, would be to stop and order spare parts and maybe come back in a week's time. So this is going to get you back on the road today. Right, in order to fit that, all we need to do now is offer that up to there. There's your new small end bearing in place. And if I pop the piston over there, and then the gudgeon pin should just push in like that. And once it's gone into the small end bearing, it should just slide home. And we might just it's need tap. to just give it a gentle tap with a small rubber hammer. That's it. And it shouldn't need too much. Is that going in? Yeah. Lovely. And what I'm doing here is I'm supporting the conrod as well at the back. Now, ideally, and you'll find if you look in a workshop manual, there's a special tool to push that in. The thing to remember is, if you do have to tap a gudgeon pin, don't give it lots of clout, because you can actually bend the conrod. And that'll make the piston run at an angle in the bore, mm -hmm. and you'll do more damage than you've solved. But as long as you're gentle with it, and it's tapping in okay, yeah. need to it needs to go a little, little bit further. Will it go by hand? Nope. No. If I support that, do you want to use the drift that we used before? Oh, oh in fact, yes, use your new gudgeon pin, because we can't use it to run the engine. And that's it. And here's an extra tip. Always, always use brand new piston circlips each time you disturb a piston. If one of those circlips should come off with the engine running, it will terminally damage the cylinder bore and do more damage than what you've just cured. Right, so with the new piston fitted, we've now got the barrel engaged on the rings, and if you just ease that down here... That's it. That's it, and that slides down. We've got a new cylinder base gasket here, which I'm just holding in place, and as the crankcase engages there on the go. cylinder mouth, there she is, and that's the cylinder barrel down. Beautiful. Uh, right, next step is to put the studs back in, and then we can put the cylinder head back on. That's actually been a fairly painless operation, apart it from... Has, the, yeah. Slight technical hitch with the gudgeon pin being the wrong size, but I suppose this happens, isn't Not it? Not to worry. Last thing to put on is a silly head. If you'd like to pass me that over, let's just have a quick glance inside it. I don't think there's, there should be any cause for alarm there. As I say, there are no moving parts. Uh, that's fairly clean inside as well, being such a new bike. Yeah. But if, sometimes carbon builds up in there, so it's worth giving it a clean if it needs it. But I'm just going to put straight on. The odd thing about this engine design, though, that rather surprised me, there's no gasket here. No. And I have to say, I'm not used to that at all. Yeah. I think every motorbike two-stroke engine I've ever worked on, in fact, every motorbike engine I've ever worked on has had a cylinder air gasket. Mm. But this is just a metal-to-metal -metal joint. Yeah, it's a lot easier. Yes, it yeah. It works. And it's obviously, you know, it's machined well enough to not, yeah. to not be a problem. So that just slides onto there. Oh, it's nice to get out for a break after it that. Is. We seem to be in doing sun, quite well. In the sunshine. Are you pleased with the way it's coming along? Yeah, I think so, so far. I have to say I'm quite impressed by the design of that scooter. It's yeah. simple, but it's functional. Do you find that these things are quite easy for people to maintain? They are really, yeah. As long as you've got a basic idea of what you're doing, yeah. um, everything's easy to get to. Um, you can change the oil easy enough. There's no chain or anything to worry about. Mm. Um, just got your spark plug and your carburetor, which is quite easy to work on. Um, all your cables are quite easy to get to as well, to adjust. So for a beginner who's coming to this looking for reliable transport that's dependable and they don't have to have a degree in mechanical engineering yeah. in order to keep it running then, is that, is that fair? That's right, yeah. But if someone was coming to this new then, would you recommend that they went for classic design like a Vespa or, or go for something more modern and automatic? It depends what they want really. Um, if they want to have something a little bit more stylish then, yeah, go for the Vespa. Yeah. Um, but if they want to be with the in-crowd with the kids, Probably a twist and go is more the way yeah. to go. We better go and fix yours then, <laughs> have we? Okay then. <laughs> okay, right. Right, if you just nip those down now to hold the cylinder head on. I'm going to tighten them up diagonally so it doesn't uh, warp the head. Yeah, yeah, excellent tip. And you'll also find as well a workshop manual will advise you to use a torque wrench for this yeah. to make sure that they tightened up correctly. Um, of course, on a cylinder head this small, it's most unlikely that you do any damage unless you were ham fisted. But nonetheless, if in doubt, if in doubt, use a torque wrench on it. And I can see there you're putting the long nut on the back yep. as well. That holds and the that's, that's the mounting for the cowling, isn't it? And before it all goes back together, of course, we'll try turning it over on the kickstarter yep. just to make sure that all those parts are working smoothly. Because if there should be any problem in there, we need to know about it before yeah, we try good. to start the engine up. 
Right, so that's the cylinder head back on. The final step then is this cowling for the air cooling. That's that's a bit bit of a juggle to get that over, is it? Yeah, it's just catching on the petrol pipe at the back there. Right. Is that clear? I, I, am I holding that in a useful place? I think so. <laughs> it's going. There we go. A bit of a fiddly design as are all of these things, but there we go. There we go, that's on. Now, I thought you said it needs forcing then. I'm sure you mean it means just gentle a little bit of gentle persuasion. There we go. And that's it. That's on at the bottom as well. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic. Right, and this screw with the catch plate goes in at the bottom. What, yep. What's that little plate for then? It's for a different exhaust that I've got, a scorpion pipe. Ah, I see. Is that a performance pipe? It is, yeah. Right, and do you find it makes a noticeable difference? Uh, about 10 mile an hour on the top end. Really? Yeah, it's quite good. I'm amazed. Frankly, I really am. Is that because these things are very restricted in the standard system? They are a bit restricted, um, but a standard pipe will pull better through the rev range. Will it? Yeah. So if you put a performance pipe on, you get more power at the expense of tractability yeah, then? that's right. Right, I see. Right, and that hooks on. Yep. You better just give me a hand with that, uh, Ian. You're familiar with this? Lovely. I see from the sticker up here that this colour is called English Green. So that must be a special colour yeah. for us. There we go, hand seat down. Job sorted. Done. Okay, do you want to have a ride on it and let's see if she's any better? Yeah, I think we'd better do. Ian's riding fairly steadily on this short test run and the idea here is to make sure that all the parts of the engine are fully settled down and bedded in before the engine gets used to its full potential. It's most important that he does a test ride like this after any kind of engine work to make sure there are no oil leaks, no fuel leaks and nothing amiss. Finally, when he comes back to the workshop, we'll make sure that everything's as it should be and he can then start to use the scooter as it was designed. And don't forget to come back next week to see the next patient in Dr. Rod's bike surgery.